This I'm is Joseph, Joseph Caldwell. Caldwell, and we are the Sales Wolves. The original. The original. The yeah, OGs. The, OGs. <laughs> the bearded OGs. So what is a Sales Wolf? If I boiled it down, I'd say they're probably the most hungry. Right? Yeah, absolutely. They're the most hungry. Absolutely. Sales Wolves are hungry. Why are we doing this? So there's twofold. Uh, so number one, it's about showing appreciation and support uh, to what is an underappreciated uh, person, it's the salesperson, and uh, you, you said on the first podcast, you know, you, when you when you're at a party, or you walk into a room, and people are saying, you know, hey, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? You know, hey, I'm a lawyer. Oh, that's awesome. I'm a doctor. Hey, that's awesome. Engineer. Hey, I'm a, I'm a salesman. Ugh, God, Ooh, God, sorry. <laughs> it's almost like they're like, oh, I'm sorry. So are you working on something different? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, oh, tough breaks, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, we all can't win. <laughs> <laughs> you fail in school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is ridiculous because ridiculous. The, you know, salesmen, are, salesmen and women are, are what make the world go round. Nothing would so, be, no, no product would be made, no product would be shipped, no product would be consumed unless it was first sold. 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 Period. So that's the first task. And the second task uh, is to provide real, tactical training um, real value that you can take and put into use out in the field, uh, whatever that sales uh, field may be for you, and that you can actually um, use to, to better yourself and better your performance and better your sales and, and, and all for free. Right. And you know what, man? Some people are, some people are watching this and they're going, well, well, I'm not in sales. And they're getting ready mm -hmm. to click off this, not, not watch the podcast, and that would be a mistake. That would be. Because we believe... Well, we believe because it's true uh, that every single person is in sales. Mm -hmm. In some form or fashion in their life, you're in sales, right? Um, you, you have a, a new little baby girl, right? Mm -hmm. Does she always want to eat her whatever that mm -hmm. you're trying to... No. You got to sell that thing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just about to say that. <laughs> right? It starts out like that, yeah, right? Absolutely. We've got to set. You have to sell. If you're the, if you're the single parent, if you're the, if you're that doctor. That, that's proud of who he is when he walks into a party or whatever because that's such an accepted profession. You you know whether you're good at what you're doing or you know whether people like you. You know whether you're really successful at what you're doing and it takes sales skills, yeah. period. Yeah. So I want to get to, right into the first topic because we want to provide tactical things that you can actually use, but there will be an overarching theme of every single topic that we ever discuss, and it'll be probably the narrative of our entire podcast, and that's hard work. Hard work. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a misnomer. People, people don't even know what that means anymore. They don't even... It, it's, it's this paradigm. This, you, we were talking about it earlier and talking about, talking about the, the rep for this, that, man, I worked hard this week, man, <laughs> nine to four... You know, took some clients to lunch, and I drove a hundred miles all week, and mm -hmm. you know, I mean, ridiculous, absolutely, man. Put on, man. I, every night I was at dinners putting it on the expense account, man. Out late. I mean, what? What is that? Man, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The the thing that's encouraging to me, uh, and and the reason why I'm so excited to be able to share that narrative with everyone about hard work is that I do believe that people aren't born with hard work ethic. Nope. I think it's something that not only do you learn over time, but it's that it's, it's it ebbs and flows, right? Sure. You're you're gonna have periods of time where you can crank it, and you can be at an all time high, and then you'll have periods of time where it you know life happens. It dips. But there's certain things that can spark those yep. those uh, those momentum t uh, changes, and, and that's what we want to be is that spark. Sure. Uh, because. 
people really don't understand what hard work is. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there are so many hours in the day wasted. Uh, <laughs> I'm so sick Most and of tired of hearing people say, "I don't, I don't have the time," or "I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have, I don't have enough time." You have enough time. The chances are you're probably just wasting seventy percent of it. At, at least, <laughs> at least, you know, the average yeah. salesperson, the amount of income producing activity, the number of hours that they actually spend in a day, if we actually knew that number, it's, it would be embarrassing. 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 You're right. So, I mean, that's what we want to do is we want to, we want to focus on the fact that you don't have to have any skills, talents, and abilities that are specific even to your industry if you have the hard work ethic. If you have right. that piece locked down, yeah. we can. I would. I'll take someone that has very little skills and talents, but has an insane hard work ethic. Any day over I'll the change, person, I'll change the world with that person. Oh, absolutely, I'll change the world with that person. And and you were one of those people, man. Um, now you had some. <laughs> you have abilities and talents, <laughs> not very good ones, but <laughs> but. Uh, but it's been amazing to see what's happened with this. I mean, yeah. I, I, I can tell you, people talk to me now, I'm nothing special. Mm -hmm. um, and people are like, well, you I, you make this and you do that. And I'm like, no, I, I really am nothing special. There, I've done nothing that somebody else can't do. And hard work is at the cornerstone. Um, you know, it's funny is we hear a lot, we're in the South, right? And uh, we hear it in church, you hear it in, uh, yeah, it's, it, you, we're in a state that sells a lottery, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and our society is a something for nothing or, 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 uh, entitled. In, in, well, not just entitled, but they want instant gratification. Mm. If they're not entitled, they want it now anyway, right? If they're not, they, they want instant gratification. I, I want, it's a drive through mentality mm. in our society. And, uh, and I always, I love the, 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 Example, I heard it. I heard it in some church I was in, but it was seed time, harvest time, right? People talk about that because it relates to the farmer. And um, but I was thinking back to that, and even they were teaching it wrong. <laughs> they were talking about two seasons, right? They were talking about a seed time and a harvest. And um, and so when it comes to hard work, which one of those is harder? What well, was it hard to put the seed in the ground? Sure, not really. <laughs> All right, fill my funnel. So, when you were in college, back in the fifties, that's funny, hilarious. <laughs> Did you ever used to funnel beers on I, occasion? That can be neither confirmed nor denied. It probably happened. It, um, <laughs> not that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was thinking about this topic today and about and about prospecting and, and your pipeline yep. and things like that, and, and I started to think about that scene from the movie Old School. Oh yeah, that's hilarious uh, with Will Ferrell. With Will Ferrell, we that's one of the funniest. We things choose ever. our analogies from the most classic. You know, the, just yeah. your 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 top quality movies. You're, you're gone with the wind. <laughs> yeah. Your Billy Madison. Yeah. Your <laughs> Shawshank. And then Shaw old school. Old school, right? <laughs> so on old school, when he's walking, th when Will Ferrell is walking through the party, and the guys are you know filling up the funnel, and they're funneling beers, and, and they look at him like, "Hey man, come on, why don't you funnel a beer?" And he's like, "No, no, 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 I got, I got, yeah, you know, I can't, I gotta go, I gotta go. My wife, you know, I gotta get home to her." And and then all of a sudden he says. Okay, all right, we'll, just, we'll do just one. one. We'll one, do just one. one. They're like, all right, all right. And so they fill it up, and he takes it, and then the first thing he says, when it hits your lips, he was like, oh, it feels so good. <laughs> fill it up again. Fill it up again. And so that's, <laughs> so that's, really, that's really what we wanted to be able to ultimately get out of this conversation on prospecting is it is something sales, and especially the prospecting side, to me is highly emotional. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of ups and downs and riding waves of momentum. And what we wanted this particular podcast today and this, and this topic of prospecting to do is, is just that. We wanted to, to, to grab you and yep. take you back to where you should have been yep. and then get you excited to where you want to keep it, yep. keep filling it up over and over and over. And, and you know the problem that I see with prospecting and the way people feel about it is they they see it they see the phone calls they see the the cold calls they see the walking in a door um, they see the emails they see that as a necessary evil mm -hmm. right and that's a problem if you see the the hundred phone calls you should be making in a day the 200 phone calls you should be making in a day the 25 to 50 doors you should be walking through in a day if you see that as a necessary evil 
I'm telling you, you're you're destined for failure. You really are. Mm -hmm. It and 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 the whole the whole thing with this is 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 ignite your fire to fall in love with that. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you when I started. Uh, I was selling with a, I was selling with a large payroll company, and 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 I literally hated the phone. Mm -hmm. I I hated it, and I refused to do it. It weighed a hundred pounds. A thousand. Yeah. Um, and I felt like I woke up with it sitting on my chest, right? I, I hated I when I thought I had to, to, to make those phone calls. And then when I when I had the thought of, of walking in doors of businesses and, and, and cold calling, oh my God, terrified, right? And the only thing that got me over that was falling passionately in love with doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I had a manager one time that at the end of the week, I always did well because I had some charisma and I would get people to refer me business and, and I worked the channels that were comfortable, Sure. right? But I never did those phone calls or those cold calls. And I had a manager that brought me in his office one day. He had just started. He brought, you playing footsie with me under here? I felt that, it was yeah, a little awkward. That was awkward. <laughs> I, you're now glistening a little bit more. <laughs> That's um, he, he brought me in the office on a Friday and he said, hey, so tell me about you had a good week, you sold this. I was like, yeah, yeah. And he asked me, he said, he said, so so show me where you did your 100 phone calls and you did you walked in 25 places a day. And I went, what? I, did, I mean, I, I, I got the results, man. I didn't need to do that, right? And he goes, no, 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 that was, that's part of your job is, what, <laughs> is, is doing that right now. And I was scared. I was like, no, nah, but... Did you see how many I sold? <laughs> you know, I was, because uh, my sure. charisma results. would always get me out of that. I was just showing him the results. I was going, hey, I sold this many. I'm good. And uh, and he said, no, I told you that this is what was required every day. And uh, and he said, I got to be honest with you. This is your one mulligan. <laughs> I had never played golf at the time. I didn't know that that was my one do-over. <laughs> I thought I was like, my God, he's going to give me a disease or something. <laughs> but... But, uh, but so I had one do-over and he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, are you scared of the phone? And I was like, scared? I ain't scared of nothing. So another man asked me if I was scared. Mm -hmm. You don't want to admit that. Are you scared to walk in the door someplace? He wasn't taunting me. He was asking. I said, I ain't scared of nothing. He said, great. So Monday morning, I'll be here at seven. You be here at seven. We'll do 30 minutes of emailing and get all of our stuff in order. And then you and I are going to hit the road. <laughs> and I went, oh my God, I couldn't breathe the whole weekend. I bet. Whole weekend, man. I was terrified. But what happened was we went in and we started making those. I think he, I think we, we started cold calling first, we drove to my territory, started cold calling, cold called till about mid afternoon. And then we made phone calls until my fingers about bled. Hmm. And it was miserable. He stayed with me all that week and we did it time and time again. And what happened was I not only overcame my fear, I saw the results. I saw that I could do that and I could conquer doing that. And and not only that, but I was winning. If you want to do something different in your life, it all starts with you. So it was probably three, come probably getting close to three and a half years ago. I was I was kind of at that turning point in my life. Um, I had had some failures in sales. Um, I was a financial advisor right out of college and, and was extremely successful doing so. And a long story short, with a crazy occurrence, I, I was terminated from that job uh, and, and lost what, what I thought was gonna be my career for the rest of my life. And that kind of sent me down this spiral of one sales job after another to where I was ultimately scared to go all in. I was scared to really put a full effort into it because I thought it could just get taken away again. And, and that kind of transformed into also not being willing to go all in because I can use that always as an excuse for when I failed. So it's very easy to say, hey, you know, you, you got fired from that job or you didn't, you didn't succeed there. Oh, I wasn't really trying. Yeah, it was, yeah. It, was, it, was, it was just it was the easiest excuse ever. Just don't try out, just don't go all in. Yeah. That way you've got that excuse of, yep. just in your own head, not to other people, just, well, you know, it didn't really work out, but I wasn't, I wasn't really trying. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't yeah. really, it wasn't really my full effort. If I would have right. really tried, I would have been fine. I would have crushed, crushed it. it. Yeah. Um, so, finally. Do you think there's other people out there that lie to themselves on a daily basis about I, where they are? I would think I'm not the only one. I, I would have to say that's true. <laughs> I would hope so. So look, I lied to myself for years, yeah. for years, and I played the blame game, right? Mm -hmm. I came from poor, so I'm doing really good now. 
I used the, I used where I came from to 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 point to that and go well it, you know I'm better than that or I'm I'm doing better than my parents mm -hmm. did and when when that was just an excuse to not actually do excellent right yep. and and then I, I I played the blame game in jobs too when I had jobs I got I think I've gotten fired from every job I've ever had except for <laughs> the one at the bank I actually I actually <laughs> um, resigned from that job. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's not easy to admit, right? If you're out there and you have a string of failures, let me just tell you, the one thing you haven't done that successful people do is you have not looked in the mirror and gone, it's the man in the mirror. Mm -hmm. It's your fault. Everywhere you were in life three and a half years ago, mm -hmm. and for me, six, seven years ago, it was at the bottom. I was at the bottom, mm -hmm. right? You know, and this is hard to admit, right? I had... Um, I had knee surgery five summers ago, six, six summers ago, had knee surgery. Mm -hmm. You want to know who paid for that? Not you. Not me. You know who paid for it? Taxpayers. The government. Yeah, <laughs> taxpayers paid for it. You know how embarrassing that is? Yeah. That's right. freaking embarrassing sure. to me. I understand getting a hand up. But I can't stand a hand out. I never wanted to be that guy. But I was in that position. My kids had to go to the doctor on on the government, and I was blaming. Oh, I got fired from this job. It put me in this situation, yeah. right? It put me in this. All these extraneous things were there. But but don't we at the end of the day have to look in the mirror? And when you come to the point where you can absolutely look in the mirror and go, Hey, it's your fault for everywhere you are in your life right now, good or bad. Good or bad, it's your fault. You came to that place. Yeah, that's exactly it? where I was. I mean, and, and it's the cliche term of just sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it was. It was just, yeah. it, and you said playing the blame game. It's it's playing the victim. It, <laughs> it was like, it was always this big victim card. You know, oh, well, I'm here and I'm doing this, but listen to all these things that happened to me. I was fired because of this and it shouldn't have happened. And I had this great career. And, and then... You know, this happened and this happened and this happened, and it was always talking about the negative, which only you know is going to create yep. more negative. And so you're exactly right. It, it for me, it was literally looking in the mirror. Yeah. Uh, I know. I know it's you know figuratively, but I was literally looking in the mirror, and I'm like, okay, something's got to change. Yep. And the encouragement there, and, and and what's exciting about that is if if you got yourself into the situation, if it's 100% your fault, if you got yourself to where you are, then you can get yourself Boom. out of it. Number and one key, you gotta listen to what he just said. If, when you find, that's the key to this whole thing, when you look in the mirror and you go, it's my fault, then what that does is that breaks the handcuffs off. Mm. Right. If someone else got me into this mess, if I blame my childhood, well, somebody abused me. I'm sorry if that happened. Happened to me. You can get over it. Right. So if 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 you blame someone else for where you are, it puts handcuffs on you because now you need that person to get you out of it mm. or that entity. I got fired from my job. That's why I'm here. You just handcuffed yourself until you take personal responsibility for it. Sometimes you have to step on their neck and make them bleed. And I went, this is part, that's exactly what we're talking mm -hmm. about. Push. Absolutely. Just just doing that motion of knocking on knocking on a door just reminded me of, of my story when I first got started mm -hmm. uh, as a financial advisor knocking on doors. <laughs> and, and I'm talking about knocking on so many doors that I never told you this. I used to uh, carry a golf ball in my pocket and I would when I went up to the door, I'd go tap, 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 tap because my knuckles would be so sore from knocking on doors all day long. I love it. Uh, I can remember when I first got started, it was the middle of the summer, and I'm in a full suit knocking on doors. And when I mean knocking on doors, I mean parking in a residential neighborhood, getting out, and then getting back in three hours later and going to another residential neighborhood. The knot on my tie would be soaking wet. I'd always have to bring a change of shirt, and at lunch I would change shirts. And uh, <laughs> so... So literally, when, awesome. it, when, when it comes to what we're talking about today and, and keeping on uh, showing up, I would go out and I would knock on people's door and I would just introduce myself. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm Tyler Harris, financial advisor right down the road from you. Just out here doing a little good old fashioned advertising. So, so, so wait a minute, you weren't, you weren't selling lawn care or Nothing. something at their house. You were a, a, a very, very prominent company in America. Mm -hmm. 
um, financial advisor mm -hmm. and you ran the office yep. and you knocked on doors like that. Yep, I just said I'm doing a little good old fashioned advertising and, and we just spark up a conversation. Um, and, and it was so funny, and it's funny that you say that, like I can remember specifically this, uh, like a some type of young professionals organization or some organization that I went to one time, a big meeting, and they were kind of all talking about what we do. And, and I mentioned that I knock on doors and this financial advisor with some other company, he looked at me and literally looked down to me and he said, knock on doors? Like, interesting. And just walked off. Um, but knocking on doors, I can remember one time. That guy that bro. Yeah, That's right. a fact. I can remember one time specifically that I knocked on a person's door. Man came to the door, started a conversation. Happened to just mention in passing as I was leaving because he mentioned that he had some some CDs that were coming due, um, certificates of deposit, not compact disc. <laughs> <laughs> but he had some CDs you coming due. <laughs> and as I'm as I'm walking out, I said, "Hey, just so you know, we we've, we've got a really good municipal bond that just came in inventory." And just in passing as I left, he called me. I think three hours later, this was on a Friday. I remember because he called me, and he said, "Hey, do you still have any of that uh, municipal bond left?" Yeah, absolutely. I said, How, what do you want to start with? He said, I'll do 100000 So that was on a Friday. That Monday, I think he bought like 75000 more. The following week, another 100000 And then he ended up rolling in like $1.2 million of his portfolio to me. Boom. From knocking on his door. That sounds weird. <laughs> but, <laughs> but getting right into these tips. Um, with, when it comes to the follow-up, the first one we want to go through is is probably one of the most important, and that is you always want to have a clearly defined next step after always. every conversation, after every meeting, if it's an initial meeting, if it's one of your third, fourth, fifth meetings, if it's on your tenth phone call, yep. that you never end that call or end that meeting without having a clearly defined action item. Okay, so so here's what we went over today and here is our next step yep. and put a time stamp on That's that right. next step. Because unless you do that, you're gonna walk out of that room, you're gonna hang up that phone, and then the next time it comes around to give that person a call you have nothing really to go off of you have nothing you have nothing set in stone it's all about accountability keeping right. both keeping yep. each other accountable right well there's if you look at it like a timeline you're starting here with a prospect or I'm starting here with Tyler mm -hmm. and I want to get Tyler to here right and so on the follow-up if I don't if I don't clearly define my next step in our interaction if I don't if there's not a call to action yeah. Um, if there's not, if it's not moving you this way, then the next time we talk, where am I? Mm -hmm. I'm at the same place mm -hmm. or further behind. Yeah. No one can stand on a soapbox and preach about work-life balance no. to a, a group of people that are so completely different. Can't do it's it. It's just impossible. So that, awesome. I do want to start off by that so that you know that this is not us, that we're going to try to give you the answer to work-life balance. The answer is that there is no work-life balance. There is work no work-life balance. balance. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So That's I think we can just kind of call it what it is. So work-life balance is an excuse. That's all it is. It's it's a crutch. It's something to hide behind. That's right. Uh, and it and unfortunately, it's an excuse that people use for their lack of work ethic, their yep. lack of results, and ultimately their lack of ambition because it's where they want to go, not just right. what they've done, but where they but what they want to do. It's it's used as an, as an excuse for that. And the funniest part about that is, I heard you say this in one of your Facebook lives yeah, that night. It was yeah. fri uh, last Friday. Awesome. Um, and it just live, it is way. just randomly randomly came out. wasn't even talking about that originally. We just run off on a rant on it because we're so sick and tired of it. But it is only you only hear people talking about work life balance that aren't really working. Right. That aren't doing well in their career. Yep. You never you never hear the person that's like, oh, I'm an I, I I am just crushing it in sales this month. But I've been a terrible dad. Well, yeah, no, no. <laughs> it's always the opposite. It's always like I've been a great dad this week. My sales have suffered a little, but I've been a great dad. And they don't they use it as an excuse. So <laughs> so I'm I've I 
I'm a great whatever it is at home. And we're not telling you to ignore your kids, by the way. Yeah. Um, you spent, what, the first three months of your daughter's life? Ten with weeks her. straight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was incredible. That was awesome. Yeah. Because the previous months, yeah. you were working. Yeah. yeah. There was no sleep. There was no, yeah. I mean, you hammered down, right? Mm -hmm. And so you could do what you wanted to do there. Yeah. But nobody uses that work-life balance, like you're saying, as an excuse mm -hmm. for <laughs> the opposite, right? They use it so I don't, I don't, I don't need to work as much because I, I need a better, I need to work life balance. They, they don't, they don't say, man, whew, I've been too good of a dad. I need to let, <laughs> I need I to need, cut it back. I, I, I need, need to rein it back a little bit. I need to rein back my fatherhood and uh, jeepers cry. I need to lay it down at work. I haven't more. seen one of my kids cry in at least a month. In at least a month. I need, somebody's got to cry. We've got to, man, my marriage, my marriage is far too good. <laughs> I need to actually spend more time at work. No, no. She's getting a little spoiled. She's a little... <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about she our wives. To... <laughs> <laughs> She's realized how bad other wives have it. <laughs> yeah. I need to go, I need to stay away longer. I mean, and these are just examples. These aren't real life. These aren't real, this is not real life. <laughs> The word try is is probably one of the stupidest words that's ever existed in the history of language. So I want Tyler to try to pick that pin up. Try. I did. Try. No, you didn't I pick the pin hard. up. You didn't pick it up. Uh, didn't pick it up. <laughs> try. He picked it up. He didn't try to pick it up. He picked it up. See, there, it, in the in the immortal words of 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 Yoda, Yoda <laughs> "Do or do not." There is no try. You don't. There's no try. Try doesn't exist. You you do something or you fail at it. You don't do it, mm -hmm. right? And so, procrastination is one of those words that I believe should be should be bundled up with try, and and burned in a socialist communist sack. My story is one of struggle, victory, and reality. My journey to the authentic, authentic with myself first, which is self-aware, right? If you're not aware of you and your gifts, talents, abilities, and what you're not good at, mm -hmm. the things that are your weaknesses, your blind spots. I have a good friend of mine that does does a talk on blind spots. and. And it's an incredible talk because it's a it's a it's a it's a motivator of self awareness. If if you don't know that, it all starts there, right? Authent authentic with my family and friends. If you're real with the people around you, authentic in my work. And once you become authentic in your work, then it's what work, work, mm. work. I wrote work down five times. Then relentless, <laughs> relentless, relentless, relentless. I wrote that down four times. And then growth, growth, growth. Growth only comes on the tail end of work, 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 relentless, 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 only. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when you have that growth finally, when you see some of the fruits of your labor, that's when a lot of people stop. And, and that's when you need to get ramped up. You never rest on a victory. That's what I wrote here. Never rest on a victory. Plow ahead. I am the subjugator of change. And so you know what subjugate means. I wrote the definition down. Subjugate is to bring under control, bring under complete control or, su or subjection, conquer, master, to make submissive, subservient, enslave. A subjugator is one who conquers, who defeats, who enslaves, conqueror, vanquisher, someone who is victorious by force of arms. Okay, there's some definitions so you understand what subjugator means, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a serious this is serious. Yeah. So why am I the subjugator of change? Here's why. When, when I, I believe that inside the heart of every person is is the yearning for a fight, a battle, right? Um, and typically what we do is we turn that outward. Um, in, in the form of blame or 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 in the form of of uh, fighting for something external. When, when I believe that if every person would take that battle that's built into all of us, I know, 
I know, man, I'm, half the time when I was on my way um, and, and, and going through the journey of succeeding and making some money and, and whatever, I would, make a, I would wake up mad as hell. I would wake up angry, looking for a fight. And, uh, and so it wasn't until I realized where to turn that, that things really started changing for me. A lot of people point to this uh, huge winning shot mm -hmm. in the game defining moment and that burning bush yeah some burning bush experience or uh, you know I don't know how to define it I've never had one right sure. I've won at high levels mm -hmm. but those weren't my defining moments they all happened far far before that they were all very very little um, you know you take a ship and you get it one degree off course and and a couple days later you're completely off course. Mm -hmm. So the defining moments are the little things, the little things. And you were talking about a couple of them, hitting the snooze button. Yeah, I mean, because you know? just when you say the word defining, defining sounds like this grandiose, it sounds like this large, monumental, yeah. life-changing thing. But it's so small, and they're hidden throughout your day. Yep. And the way that you identify them is become by becoming more self-aware. That's the way that you can identify these little moments. But that's one of the biggest ones, and it's the first one that happens to you every single day. When your alarm goes off in the morning, that is a defining moment in how you start your day. Right. You can hit snooze, and you can go back to sleep for 15 more minutes, 20 more minutes, an hour longer. Yeah. Or you can get up out of bed, get a shower, get doing something productive, get to the gym, get to the office, get to whatever you're doing. And by making that, it's all about a choice. And by making that decision in that moment to do the right thing versus doing the wrong thing, you have set the course for the rest of your entire day. People do business with people, not entities. Uh, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that the quote that we quote a million times is people don't know how much you care, or people don't know, care what you know until they know how much you care. Right. Um, who was it that said that? Is it Brian Tracy? I think it was me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure. See how hard he laughed? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was Brian Tracy. I think it was. Maybe it was somebody else, honestly. Could have been Zig Ziglar, um, though. It was, yeah. one of the, it was one of the greats yeah. that said that. One of them. But people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so much of that is 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 embodied in that personal, uh, t being able to read body language. Sure. Uh, a statistic I found that said 93% of communication effectiveness is determined by nonverbal cues. Right. So if you're not face to face, if you're not knee to knee, it, it, there's so much, there's so many elements of communication that's just completely off the table. Missing. Um, yeah, most of, I mean, 93% of communication effectiveness is determined by nonverbal cues. Yeah. So how can you see a nonverbal cue if you're not face-to-face? -face? Mm -hmm. How can you really communicate somebody unless you're knee-to-knee, eye-to-eye, across a table, or a coffee shop, or whatever, whatever. whatever and it's, and it's, the, it's the little things, but it's the crucial things that are missed, the crucial elements of communication that are missed in those situations, because you could be one facial expression away. Uh, from somebody completely taking something in a different context than the way you meant it. Um, there's so many times that that happens through text. You know, you oh my text gosh. And, and you send one, and it's just she's like a spouse. Like you send a text to your spouse, and she's like, oh my gosh, why are you in such a bad mood? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa I, I didn't mean it like that. Like, yeah, I, I'm not I didn't in a bad mood. I'm in a great <laughs> yeah. mood. Yeah, like with punctuation. Oh, yeah, well, you're sleeping on the couch tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Punctuation becomes very, very important. Very important. <laughs> An exclamation point. Did you or, eat, uh, comma, grandma, or <laughs> did you eat did grandma? You? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> there was one with a horse and a guy named Jack. I can't remember. But, oh, um, no.